yourself, what's that got to do with what's about to happen? Nothing, really. don't worry about it. It's a good friend. Right. Uh, how many people were here in 2019? So, you'll remember that I closed contact in 2019. We did something rather special. Yeah. Uh, thanks to my guys at Moon, we got to see what was potentially going to be the first three episodes of Transformers Animated Season 4. Kevin is a surprise. After that event, prior to obviously the unpleasantness, I was very much racking my brains as to what in the world you can do to top it. And that was really the wrong way to think about it. You know, like, you, you always want to try and do something better and cooler and things like that, but it's always better to do something different. But what do we do? You know what I mean? Then, this fell into our lap. And I was very, very excited, because I didn't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> I hope you all enjoy this. This is a chance to see something as I said before, you've never seen um, and something that is going to be public for the very first time. I am not, however, going to be involved in this because there were two men in Swell. One man who was instrumental in starting this and another man who is entirely trustworthy in relaying this information. Ladies and gentlemen, to the stage, it's Jim Sorensen and Mr. Chris McMillan! Had ever aired just after the final episode of the first season had been written. 
And the treatment is the basic outline of the film. And as I recall it, that's what we slew the first page of, which describes broadly the first scene of this version of the film. And we had the whole thing. And we, uh, you know, Flint is uh, protective of his material, uh, so we haven't been able to release it yet. But what we did get was permission to give a very detailed summary of you know, what's going on in the movie, how things are different, and what's, what's the real treat? You're talking about what we're going to be showing yeah. on the screen here, too. Maybe we should, should show it. I think we should. Yeah. Brought to uh, life by a very talented team of artists from TF Nation. Everything we say to you today will be a company. Is that you or me? I think that was me. <laughs> All right, so, the moment. We'll be accompanied by brand new illustrations featuring some very old Floro Deary designs, some brand new designs that our artists at TF Nation here have created. And uh, I guess we will start the story now. It is not the year 2005. <laughs> this is where we begin. Or is it over? Oh, oh, that's what? Sorry. what? Opening 
battle scene that is described as the uh, it's uh, the Decepticons like cresting a hill, all these generic troopers of all shapes and sizes, and uh, uh, these long and intricate descriptions of things that are on screen for moments at a time. Yeah, and I give, I'll give you a good example of one from the second draft that made it all the way. It's not in here, but it made it all the way through the final uh, the final version of the movie. There, there's about two pages of descriptions of how the Autobot moons are producing munitions, and it goes through in elaborate detail all the things that the Autobot and the Dinobots are manning the machinery and it's making it, and that's all actually in the movie, but it's a pan that lasts about half a second, and that's you know, two pages, and this, this, is, this script is full of those. I want to just uh, read the, the first paragraph of the script. Uh, Fade in, close, on pumping, running knees of Decepticon troopers, day, they are coming right towards the camera, clanking and crunching in metallic, mechanistic precision as sound effects of battle, laser blasts, and ricochets come at them from all sides. At the same instant, the camera moves back swiftly and changes angle to reveal the knees and rock-crushing, pounding metal feet belonging to three Decepticon troopers. Again, for Christmas White, these are just generic Decepticon troopers. In strange, gleaming back, black, battle armor, which interlocks so the back sections of the armor overlap as they run side by side, making the threesome look like an incredible six-legged land crab. They are moving swiftly over uphill terrain and are carrying a long, intricately machined cannon barrel. There's so many designs that have had to be made for this. Um, across their chest. This is all happening very, very fast as they run into it, seemingly through the camera, in a hail of laser fire from the as yet unseen Autobot defenders. They move into close-up so we can see first their Decepticon insignias and then their three malevolent, red-eyed, grim, hate-filled faces. It is at this point that the narrator begins to speak over. And I love the language. I love how evocative it is. And I love the idea that had something like this been made, and it was described by Frank Lillia as uh, unfilmable at one point. What was the other? Incoherent? Incoherent. <laughs> Um, and we'll get to the incoherence, but that made sense. But I mean, imagine having toys with those guys, because of, of course they would, they'd have to, wouldn't they? Yeah. Some of the other things that are supposed to be happening, the Constructicons are building siege towers with which they, they attack the steel mill out of ore stolen from the carts that the steel mill is, steel mill's ore is delivered in. They're building them on the spot. The Friedman is constantly describing Things being constructed. Yeah, things are constantly either being constructed or occasionally just appearing without any justification any whatsoever. Built up or anything, and then disappearing with just as much. Uh, <laughs> with just, well, let, let's get to some of those, some of those wonderful things. Shall we move on to the next one? Yeah. The Autobot defenders in the steel mill. No, you've caught a glimpse of them before, but pretend this is the first time you're seeing them. <laughs> <laughs> Who are they?
But uh, everyone else is largely, as you know, the hot rod is even described in the script as a, uh, what is the phrase they use to describe him? A uh, Luke Skywalker, a young man on the brink of manhood, sort of <laughs> While uh, R.C., uh, who uh, famously was, uh, it, it was fought for inclusion in the film by Friedman himself, uh, where is the description of R.C.? Um, she is, well, she's, her introduction is this kind of a nurse figure to who, who tends the wounds of the Autobots injured in the attack, but that's not what her role in the larger film is, and, well, that's a... That's part of the story of the telling today. Yeah, uh, she's, I see the note of every time they do the thing. Mm, uh, she's described as having a contralto voice, a mix of Julia Child and Le uh, Leontine Price. <laughs> <laughs> the Decepticons have this massive attack on the steel boat with these towers that they are busily constructing and rolling into the battle, and the Autobots are trying to defend against it. And they come out with uh, a weapon that, that really struck me as uh, napalm. You know, they don't call it that, but, but that's what it is. And they called it fire snow. Yeah, uh, it's fired. Uh, uh, it's fired by the three Decepticons we, that were described in the opening sequence who climb a hill to get an, uh, an aerial position over the steel mill and transform and combine into a single cannon emplacement that fires this fire snow over the mill and uh, it nails wheeljack. Yeah, and, and, and it's horrifying. Listen to this. The incoming cannon generated cloud as it suddenly expands to four times its size, changing color as it does, and then disintegrates into thousands of white hot snow crystals, which move forward with great speed, filling the screen with deadly fire flakes, which then tinkle like fragile glass, breaking on a million silvery points as we change angle to the Autobot defensive position as the fire snow cascades onto the scene and melts through everything it touches, leaving gaps, still liquid holes in Autobots who fall and reach out for assistance, shouting for help as R.C., a female Autobot of regal bearing, hurriedly moves in as nurse using her kit bag, a mental dispenser at her side to unroll metal bandages, which she fuses on the wounded patient's melted limbs, etc. The structure of the shed, which is where they're making the defense, also shows melt holes and sections of the shed wall, punctured and dripping from the fire snow. Suddenly, Buck and Ben toppling around the defenders who try to regroup and return fire on the smoke and confusion as we hand to the scene, rapidly to exchange, during which Tanker cries out, etc. Et I think you probably me thinking of Tanker, not Wheeljack. Sorry, it's Tanker. Oh, yes, he does, because they, they patch him up. They patch him up. He, well, they patch him up. Uh, how is he described? Tanker has lost an arm and part of his shoulder as the fire snow flakes are still sizzling, melting their way into him as he grimaces and tries not to cry out. And uh, you know, here's, where, here's where we're going to get the first of uh, some of the you know, off-kilter for, for our 2022 audience. But, uh, you know, RC, I keep telling you old war chariots to retrofit with dural, dural battle metal. Dural battle metal, right? But do you listen, Tanker? Stop preaching and keep patching our sea. To himself, I skyward. She bots. <laughs> Fireballs and torpedoes, 
as it definitely rapidly moves to plus. Oops. Yep. Okay. What page are you on? I'm not keeping up with you. <laughs> to pluck a fireball out of the air, inches away from uh, Rod's head as Rod ducks back. Rod is hot. Uh, that's not a thing. Uh, and he snags a photon torpedo from a low trajectory where it is skipping across the ground, threatening to cut off RC's legs. And finally, when the bucket is too full of seething, sizzling ammo to hold on to, one last fireball, which is hurtling towards several Autobots in the looping arc, burning through steel barricades between it and them, Magnus stretches way out and bats the air and fireball with the back of the bucket, knocking it into a wet sand pile with a huge fizz and shot at steam, and then, with massive effort, still continuing the initial ballistic motion, hurls the bucket full of fiery dead back at the Decepticons who fired it, grunting explosively as we reverse to the Decepticon party, an officer who fired, again, generic near Decepticon officer, as we, we pick up the bucket and its load of fireballs, etc., as it blasts over everything, exploding one Decepticon into another, like falling dominoes, and calling the officer to dive head first into a shell hole for cover, only to have the fireball smack him in the rear, forcing him to throw <laughs> forward, stick his head off in preparation to run for it, only to have the falling iron bucket come down on his head, <laughs> burying him face down in the rock with a clang as his hands claw the air. And we hear his muffled voice, don't stand there, dig me out. <laughs> I can't do anything. He orders them around. But as he as he charges into action, Hot Rod thinks to himself, "Hurry, Optimus Prime, hurry!" Oh yeah, and let's get to the reinforcements because they were really about six pages in. <laughs> yeah, we need to pick up the pace a little bit. On the way. Okay, I'm not rushing to press it again. <laughs> There it's no it's that's in the wrong order. <laughs> Alas. If I press this twice, what's gonna happen? <laughs> I don't I wanna push it because it'll jump to the one. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know. <laughs> Look at 
floats on a laser cushion. It doesn't need rails to move. Yeah, and they do this because Starscream has Starscream has a lot to do with this film. <laughs> Starscream has landed on the tracks and tied it into a pretzel. <laughs> yeah. and, and then they turn it into a laser train and they run him over, which is the first of four times that Starscream gets his ass kicked. <laughs>
show up and have their fight, which is eerily similar to what we actually got. Uh, to the point where it's almost not so yeah, much to say, but, about, but um, you know, Hot Rod, Tanker, and oh, so Magnus, I'm not going to go through it, but Magnus has a great moment where he runs up the hill and charges and takes out the Decepticons who have that artillery they were raining down on. But here's Hot Rod, as the Autobots are getting overrun, and you know, they really need these reinforcements here now, and they're, they're doing their absolute best to just not die. Hot Rod, Tanker, and Autobot defenders in the shed, as their position has worsened, and devastation and smoldering ruins lie around them as they battle ferociously against a gang of Decepticon troopers who are charging their position as RC continues to minister to the growing pile of wounded or disabled Autobots in the background. As two Decepticon troopers come at Hot Rod, we change angle to feature the combat as Hot Rod swings his empty laser gun, he's run out of ammo, into the first trooper, knocking him into the second, presses forward, holding his weapon across the chest in two hands like a quarterstaff. One trooper grabs the weapon, wrestling for possession, and Hot Rod twists mightily, spinning that trooper upside down, knocking down the other trooper, who's about to get up and try again. And then Hot Rod kicks one trooper under the chin, and as the other one draws another side onto fire, and knocks his weapon into the air, and brings the butt of his empty gun down on him, batting him to the wall as we move around to show another Decepticon trooper coming at him from the blind side with a laser chainsaw weapon, which nicks Hot Rod on the that's my mic. <laughs> Causing him to lose balance. On Hot Rod, as the laser chainsaw wielding uh, the laser chainsaw wielding the Centricon trooper, as the trooper comes right for him. Tanker reaches into shot, grabbing trooper's foot, and tips him forward, sending him flying face forward, landing on his own laser chainsaw, which cuts him in half. Each half running off, lower half on legs and feet, other half on hands, as Tanker moves close to the Hot Rod standing back to back with him as they fight off even more Decepticons. I mean, that's... It's, it's, it's true, there's, there's so many like, last moments in these you know, horrific, horrific combat. I've been conditioned by Transformers when somebody gets uh, cut in half by a chainsaw, and I imagine it likes the worst. <laughs>
talking. He says, we'll need titanium rubidium steel. Just for the record, that's the second type of magical steel. Durolo metal, durolo metal, and titanium rubidium yeah. steel. Yeah. And there's going to be more. And we're not going to go through all of them. No, like, but there's a lot. Titanium rubidium steel to withstand Decepticon vapor lasers. <laughs> so, uh, uh, then, uh, so uh, he calls for Braun, Huffer, and Cliff Jumper to follow him. But then he notices RC's coming as well. And he's like, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's Hot Rod on page 26, where, you know, uh, Rusty is trying to get everybody to go, and Hot Rod just hangs his head. If Optimus doesn't make it, I, I, I don't know how I'll stand it. And Tanker, gruffly but kindly, but stand it, you will, lad. It's what Prime would want, and it's what's right. I mean, you know, it, it's kind of neat to see that, uh, in, in, I, I know the, the meme in the fandom is that Hot Rod killed Optimus Prime. Uh, Freeman, Hot Rod agrees with you. <laughs> <laughs> So the Autobots split into these two groups and off they go, while we return to the Decepticons. Well, we return to Cybertron. Yeah, they've gotten back, flying in the air, and they land yes. at the Decepticon Hall of Heroes. Now, this, this is a setting that made its way into the final version of the script. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's there. the Hall of Heroes, the, the room where the hall, where Starscream is coronated in the, yeah. in the finished film with all the statues surrounding him. And the statues play more of a role, but, yeah. but I was struck by this description. The hall is something like a huge rock-cut mausoleum, which resembles a mechanistic Art Deco high-tech version of the Albert Speer design setting for Hitler's Nuremberg party rally. Oh. Oh. Guys, the Nazis are all over this script, and that's not a joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll get to more of them. Yeah. A semicircular colonnade ringed by gleaming vertical columns of eerie, light-misting mechano crystals and a circular steel and paving stone platform around which are the hero receptacles, each receptacle a bronze Art Deco-style urn set on a steel pedestal within a machined, interlocking metal section constructed niche. And set above each urn, like a vertical tombstone-like coffin, is the sculpted bas-relief image of the Decepticon heroes, whose essence is pulsing, is a pulsing glow with a sculpted <laughs> chest. And that's a sort of surviving <laughs> finished film. Yeah, that's if you look closely at the scene of the finished film. Well, that's what Derek yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's uh, sculpted, it's pulsing glow with its sculpted chest, but in the, in the film, it's uh, the glow, there's a small purple flame flickering at the base of every statue. And that's it, that's it. Yes, and it's, uh, this glow diminishes to a trickle of light which descends, built down from the chest of the sculpture into the feet. And this, the idea is that this is the life essence of previous Decepticon commanders, which has been enshrined within these urns, these statues, to sort of burn forevermore. And that made it into the second draft of the script, right? It did, yes. And, but it's, it's a little different here, because when, when Megatron dies, and it's, it's not very dramatic, in the second year. Yeah. Yeah, let's. Ascends into space, 
followed by the crumbling remains sucked up in the jet stream of his own body. And, and it's this little tiny purple version of Megatron. <laughs> a translucent glass-like image of Megatron shimmers out of his body in an eerie light and starts flying up, up and out of the Hall of Heroes and away from Cybertron into deep space. Megatron's ghostly, pathetic wail continuing over, ignored by the fighting Decepticons. I will decompose in space. Preserve my essence. You must retrieve and preserve my essence. Ah! <laughs> it's such a strange image, but it gives you a sense as to why they had this idea for Starscream's ghost. Because yeah. if you don't yeah. get this, and, and this is kind of kicking around their ideas. Possibly. That's the idea that it's just a shimmering image of this thing. You know, there's no. Yeah, I mean, we didn't yeah. see that. We went a little purple, a little bit the old wireframe Megatron purple. And we were into it by yeah. what we got. But, uh, and meanwhile, on Earth, in the Autobot volcano, we get to be. <laughs> wait, our... wait for it. Hang on, let's see. Party, Ratchet's medical party returns to Autobot headquarters. Now, as we said, this is not the year 2005. No date is given for the film, but some time has passed because now the entire volcano rotates open to reveal that the whole interior is a base where Autobots and humans live and work together like as a military and civilian force. And that's where we see Springer, our burly Autobot, sparring with Mirage and Blue Streak in some training, described as a huge Arnold Schwarzenegger of an Autobot. With a good-natured face on a huge chest, the muscles in his metal arms delineated and interlocking as though cast in steel. And I think it's fascinating that at that earlier stage, you know, they were already comparing Springer to an action movie hero. But as time went on, you know, they... they Hold some ideas together and transpose Rusty's role as the wise cracking Indiana Jones character onto, onto Springer instead. It's also interesting because although we do get introduced to Springer at this point in the story, he actually doesn't do anything. No, he's just that he's just, he's he's just, just there. There. looks like trouble, you know, let's get 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 busy with as the as our heroes are doing. But but more important to the plot, believe it or not, believe it or not Springer is uh, Ellen, Dr. Ellen Prentice, who's a scientist who works here, and her son, Daniel. Ah. Daniel is about 12 and has school books in his hand as he runs onto the scene and eagerly hurries to keep pace with Rusty. It's clear Rusty's his idol, and Rusty treats him with the offhand and sarcastic wit, which makes the kid feel like a friendly peer. And, uh, Ellen would like that. <laughs> Yeah, like, like you've seen an Indiana Jones movie, right? Like yeah. you, you know how like, uh, uh, the relationship. Yeah, is it, it's, it's a really hero worship situation with Daniel and Rusty, and Rusty is totally into it. Rusty like, even calls him. Rusty even calls him Dan over like Springer. I don't know what his hot dog is to finish up, isn't it? Yep. Um, let's see what we're going And we're getting a little over, so we should probably get to the. Oh, we over already? Oh, yeah. Pretty good. We said today they, they told us we'd have a clock on screen. We don't. We want that right for it's our fault. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, uh, we're, we're near the end. So we're getting to the end of Act One. Um, you know, I mean, we've set up all the pieces. Optimus Prime uh, does expire. Galvatron is four. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting the order wrong. No, that's the, that, yes, this bit cuts back and forth. You would think these exactly. things happen one after the other, but it no, it's first we return to the volcano to meet Daniel and Ellen. We get the understanding of how their relationship and their personal relationships work. Well, we, then we follow Megatron's essence off into space, where it finds its way, summoned by a ghostly voice, to the planet Unicron. Uh, Shaped like a slab, the script describes it as being. Many times. Covered in these strange steel tree trunk forms that writhe menacingly. And the script says that while we don't know it at the time, these are the hairs on the back of Unicron's hands. Oh, oh, oh. It's the great eyebrows and things like that. Too. Yeah, the tree trunks and the, the, the tentacles. And he makes the same deal with Megatron. Well, he makes the deal with the entity. This disembodied voice that speaks from somewhere within Unicron 
and it's not presented as being the planet. It's just being presented as the boss and owner of the planet. Who, uh, who wants, who, who offers Megatron, you know, more power, etc., etc. But uh, the, the big demand that he makes of it is that that he will return to Cybertron to convert all Decepticons to his service and then lead them in the conquest of Earth. Yeah, and that's another really interesting structural change to the film. You know, in the film, the ultimate jeopardy is Cybertron might get destroyed. But in this version, it's Earth that's in peril, which is actually a pretty good choice. Yeah. And uh, you can see visually that there's, a, there's kind of an important difference with Galvatron. They describe the Decepticons well, the, the, the surface of Unicron itself. Yes, that too. Well, you... well, as being covered in these strange crystalline metallic scales. And when you, Unicron transforms Galvatron, uh, who is described as simply being a larger, more powerful, but still recognizable version of Megatron, which, well, we, we just used the classic, uh, the first Florida <laughs> draft design. I think that fits. Yeah. But he becomes covered with these crystalline metallic scales as well, and a new insignia representing his service to the oh. entity. And we can see we've got the, the scale. We couldn't cover him all in scales and still have him be recognizable. So you can see the, the scales fanning out from around the insignia on his chest. Well, and also if Hasbro was really going to do this, they would probably they would do it. Yes, change. Yeah, that's it. Uh, then after that, we return to Earth for the scene that we all know was coming. The death of Optimus Prime. No, no, no. I believe Ron, Ron has said uh, that he was mandated to kill Optimus Prime, and we were kind of speculating to ourselves how many other characters he was, if any other characters he was asked to kill. Yeah, the, the question is, how, how, much of, how much of it is he making up as he goes, and how much of it is mandated? And actually, other than Optimus and Megatron, I can only think of one, you know, 84 character who kicks it. And we'll get to we'll that in the yeah. but um, which is interesting because I, I phrased it the way I did on purpose. But the other big difference is that when, when Optimus opens his chest, the uh, well, why don't you find the exact description? But a tiny little Optimus Prime comes out and, <laughs> and goes into Magnus's chest, and Optimus calls him Ultra Magnus, ah. having done this this upgrade. Yes, uh, accompanied by ethereal bell-like signs. A glowing, pulsating, visible creature of pure, radiant energy in the form of a miniature Optimus Prime. But while Decepticons have essences, this is Optimus Prime's Matrix. Which is fascinating, because this script was turned in in November of 1984. One month before, Bob Budiansky wrote the document detailing the creation Matrix for the Marvel comic. So is it all just a massive coincidence that the two mediums use the word matrix to describe this and they wind up being collapsed together? Or was it revised later and we have a later revision of it? We don't know. And, and another thing that jumped out at me is when Optimus Prime is first dying and, and trying to pass his essence, his Autobot, his, his matrix, onto Magnus to make him Ultra Magnus, the first line he says is, my time in the light has ended. Which is very similar to the yeah, line in that Hot Rod says in Five Faces yes, of the time in the light is short. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, RC says, well, that's what Optimus Prime says when, when he died. Which it wasn't, but maybe she just read the earlier script. <laughs> uh, okay, we gotta wrap yeah. up to the end here. So, meanwhile, Galvatron returns to uh, Cybertron to uh, bring the other Decepticons into the entity's service. Starscream is the one who recognized There has not been, Starscream hasn't emerged, there's no coronation sequence or anything, but Starscream is the first one to recognize him. And Galvatron he raises his arms, and a beam of Unicron's light descends upon the Decepticons. And they too are reborn by Unicron's power. Original designs by Ed Perry here.
<laughs> As another end of those cold rates apps, you see mailing and transforming shockwave. Another protesting Decepticon says Megatron dash Galvatron laughs over, then follow the cold ray, which has transformed all the Decepticons in the Hall of Hero out through Cybertron. Surface and cities of Cybertron as we follow the cold rays, it zaps and transforms every Decepticon, perhaps every Insecticon and Constructicon on the planet, catching a group of mechano on a Meccano highway, nailing one who runs in mid-flight up a slanting elevator structure as it tries to reach a launch site on the roof, nailing another group in flight as they spiral up in the air uh, from an airfield installation trying to escape, etc. I mean, they, they get all of them, but that's not all. That's not all. Unicron order. Or the, sorry, we should say, every, if, we, if we ever say Unicron, it's all in the script as the yeah. entity. Unicron is the planet, the entity is the guy. <laughs> he orders them to Earth, and we end Act 1 with... <laughs> Watch this, Russ. Wait, 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 wait. It's video. Make it play. <laughs>